Can you hear me okay? Nice to see you all. I know it's a little differently. When was the last time we all had an opportunity to wear masks in the same place indoors? It's like the second, but thank Halloween. goodness for the folks who are following CDC guidelines so you all can be safe and healthy here, and we're just so glad you could come, and uh, we'll have a great, uh, great assembly today. So we're going to start off with a couple of songs. You don't need to stand just yet. We'll, we'll save some of that energy for a little bit later, but uh, you know the words, you know how it works, so sing along with us. Sound good? Yep. All right, here we go. heard y'all you can you can sing though that's great um we got another one for you here and this is going to feature ashley singing us this is a rocker let's go
Thank you all for coming again. Now it's time to introduce our host today, and I'm drawing a total blank. Don. Don, that's right, thank you. Okay, Don, please welcome a board member, an amazing performer, and great Sunday assembler. Don Thompson to the stage, or actually the podium. <laughs> Let's give him a hand. Okay, hello, check one, two, there we go. Thank you very much for that welcome, and thanks for pointing out where I'm going, because I never know. That's normal. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Sunday Assembly Nashville. Let me get this up a little bit closer to my mouth, because I'm a tall guy. Okay, um, now before we get started, I want to ask everybody, please, have your phones on silent. If you're not using them, uh, maybe put your screen lock on so we don't accidentally butt dial or anything like that, like we had happen a couple months ago. Okay, for the benefit of first timers and as a reminder to the rest, let me say who we are. Sunday Assembly is a secular congregation that celebrates life. Our motto is live better, help often, and wonder more. Our vision is a Sunday Assembly in every town, city, and village that wants one. Sunday Assembly has no doctrine, no set text, we make use of wisdom from all sources. We have a community mission. We build purpose and provide encouragement. We won't tell you how to live, but we will try to help you do it as well as you can because Sunday Assembly is a celebration of the one life we know we have. Now, I sat out as this month's host wanting to explore the topic of assertiveness. I'd initially looked at the subject on an individual level, the challenges and benefits of being assertive in one's own life, and it interested me because whether you may believe this of me up here speaking or not, I'm a type B personality who's had to wind myself up like a corkscrew uh, to assert myself on so many occasions. In preparing, I discovered a couple of things. The one was it was more difficult than I expected to find inspiration on the topic that didn't come off as rah-rah, Amway type, multi-level marketing stuff. So I ditched that Tony Robbins vibe and sought music that were more grounded. I also found that the aspects of assertiveness don't just benefit the individual. And I got good advice from our community. The month of June serves as example and reminder of the groups that are, are asserting themselves. So today, we expand on assertiveness and move into asserting rights. Now first off, what's the importance of assertiveness? As actress Yana Cachola put it, it's not harsh to be assertive, it's harsher when people take advantage of you. Or as women's sexuality author Maya Yamanuchi put it, being life's bitch is no fun at all. We have to resist society's traditional assumptions so we may get what we want and live our best life. You know, things like don't make waves at work by asking for better pay or working conditions, or everyone's supposed to get married and have children, or everyone's expected to believe in a religion. I'm particularly offended by our society's presumption that everyone should be Christian and that space in public life is to be relinquished automatically to Christian practice. However, social preferences for tradition in general have that same dynamic of expectation of everyone should follow along without dissent or reconsideration. We need to use assertiveness because we have the right to take up our own space with our own desires, regardless of what larger society or one's own circle may think. Now, what's the balance in assertiveness? What's too much or not enough? Psychologist Edith Eva Egger strikes a good balance by saying, to be passive is to let others decide for you. To be aggressive is to decide for others. To be assertive is to decide for yourself. You can be empathetic for others and still be assertive for yourself. Being assertive is not automatically an aggression towards somebody else, although if you're passive due to inclination or trauma, it can feel that way. Now, I want to make an important point. Assertion is usually seen as an action, as an I want this or I will do that. Just as important, though, is the negative assertion. This is the setting of boundaries, the places you will not go to the tasks you will not be talked into, the conditions you're not okay with. Explanations why are not generally required. As the saying goes, no is a complete sentence. 
The author Henry Cloud said, it's extremely important to be able to make negative assertions. We must be able to say what is not me in order to have a me. Our yes has no meaning if we never say no. When we're comfortable with asserting ourselves or when we're motivated to overcome our reluctance, we may find the ability to engage with others and act collectively to say what we want or draw the line at what we no longer accept. This month observes an historic example of collective assertiveness, the Stonewall Uprising, which gave birth in America to the rise of the LGBTQ community. When police raided the Stonewall Inn on June 28, 1969, members of New York City's LGBTQ community who were used to such raids found the wherewithal to draw the line and assert that they would not accept this treatment. Now, 53 years later, June is known as Pride Month in recognition of the Stonewall Uprising. Our yes has no meaning if we never say no. It feels very much now like a variety of basic rights, reproductive rights, equality for people of color, freedom of and from religion, gender equality, the right to love who we wish, security and public from gun violence are all under tremendous pressure from a push for the values of tradition which can be described another way as peer pressure from dead people. <laughs> These are dead ideas, reanimated by fear, ignorance, and the hatred they can spawn. The ones who want to keep the old biases in place will push themselves beyond their own space and into yours. Dr. Martin Luther King said that the arc of the moral universe is long but bends towards justice, but it does not bend without action without each of us asserting our space and asserting the right of every human to take their space. And now it's time for the reading. Our reading today is In This Place, an American Lyric by Amanda Gorman. Please welcome to the podium, James Reels. In This Place, an American Lyric by Amanda Gordon. There's a poem in this place, in the footfalls, in the halls, in the quiet beat of the seats. It is here, at the curtain of day, where America writes a lyric. Uh, you must whisper to say. There's a poem in this place, in the heavy grace, in the lying face of this noble building, collections burned and reborn twice. There's a poem in Boston's Copley Square where protests chants tear through the air like sheets of rain, where love of the many swallows hatred of the few. There's a poem in Charlottesville where tiki torches string a ring of flame tight round the wrist of night where men so white they gleam blue seems like statues where men heat that long wax burning even higher, where heather higher blooms forever in a meadow of resistance. There's a poem in the great sleeping giant of Lake Michigan, defiantly raising its big blue head to, the Mil to Milwaukee and Chicago, a poem lo begun long ago, blazed in the frozen soil, shrouding upward in a glow. There's a poem in Florida, East Texas, where streets swell into a nexus of rivers, cows afloat like marble buoys in the brown, where courage is now so common that 23-year-old Jesus Contreras rescues people from floodwaters. There's a poem in Los Angeles, yawning wide as the Pacific tide, where a single mother swelters in a windowless classroom teaching black and brown students in Watts to spell out their thoughts so her daughter might write this poem for you. There's a lyric in California where thousands of students march for blocks, undocumented and unafraid, where my friend Rosa finds the power to blossom in deadlock, her spirit the bedrock of her community. She knows hope is like a stubborn ship gripping a dock, a truth that you can't stop a dreamer or knock down a dream. How could this not be her city? Sunecion, 
our country, our America, our American lyric to write a poem by the people, the poor, the Protestant, the Muslim, the Jew, the secular, the native, the immigrant, the black, the brown, the blind, the brave, the undocumented and undeterred, the woman, the man, the non-binary, the white, the trans, the ally to all of the above and more. Tyrants fear the poet. Now that we know it, we can't blow it. We owe it to show it, not slow it, although it hurts to sow it when the world skirts below it. Hope, we must bestow it like a wick in the poet so it can grow. Lit, bringing with it stories to rewrite. The story of a Texas city depleted but not defeated. A history written that need not be repeated. A nation composed but not yet completed. There's a poem in this place. A poem in America. A poet in every American who rewrites this nation, who tells a story worthy of being told on this minnow of an earth to breathe hope into a faucet of time. A poet in every American who sees our poem pen doesn't mean our poems end. There's a place where this poem dwells. It is here. It is now in the yellow song of Dawn's Bell where we write an American lyric we are just beginning to tell. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. By the way, for anybody who had asked me earlier today about my mask, uh, I said, is this Jesus? No, this is George Carlin, just to let you know. <laughs> Are there any people here for the first time? Could I see a show of hands? Oh, okay. Uh, let's see, one, two, three. <laughs> Thank you very much. We appreciate you coming. Even, even though it's been, uh, we had to kind of scale back because of uh, our county is now at a high rating uh, for COVID, so we had to decide we had to mandate masks, uh, and we had to cancel the potluck. This on top of our normal vaccination card required. So I really appreciate y'all coming. All right, and let's see. I lost my place. Old radio guy, I have to have a script. And now it's time for our speaker. We are very fortunate to have Dr. Marissa Richmond here today. She teaches history and women's and gender studies at Middle Tennessee State University. She's the president of the Tennessee Federation of Democratic Women and a co-chair of the Transgender Advisory Committee of the Democratic National Committee. Last year, she completed one term as the first and only black trans woman to serve on the Democratic National Committee. She's also just finished serving as a member and past chair of the Metro Nashville Human Relations Commission of the ad hoc Nashville Mayor's Council of the, the, on the Status of Women and the Data, Davidson County General Sessions Court Judicial Equity Collective. Previously, she sur served many years as the president and lobbyist for the Tennessee Transgender Political Coalition. She's a prolific author and speaker on transgender rights and has served on many boards at the local, state, and national levels. She's been recognized for her work with many awards. She has three degrees, all in U.S. history, A.B. from Harvard, M.A. from Cal Berkeley, and Ph.D. from George Washington University. I'm very honored to ask, to please welcome to the podium, Dr. Marissa Richmond. I'm going to take my mask off because otherwise my glasses will fog up. Um, it's good to be back. Uh, it's, been, it's been a while. <laughs> you know, uh, we've been through a lot. We've lost a lot. Um, but uh, I'm glad uh, that we're all here, that we're persevering and surviving. Um, as Don pointed out, this is Pride Month. Um, I'd also like to point out that uh, this weekend also marks the sixth anniversary of the massacre in Orlando at the Pulse nightclub. 
uh, 49 members of our community who are out celebrating, uh, enjoying themselves, were, were taken down by a, a, a gunman with an assault rifle. Um, we should never forget them or any of those we have lost. Uh, for those of us in higher education, the Virginia Tech massacre in particular resonates with us. And every semester I go into my classroom and I look around and try to figure out, you know, wh where's the emergency um, uh, a call box. Uh, I've had students even ask me about it and I've always answered the question, although I've never led the semester by pointing it out, but I think this time I will. Um, I think it's important that, uh, that we understand that no matter where we are, we're vulnerable until our politicians take actions. Um, thoughts and prayers may be noble, but action is going to make us safer, and we must all stand up for that. <clears throat> of course, when the Pulse Massacre did take place, many of us praised the police, but as we've seen, that's not always been the case. Um, the, the pride celebrations that take place throughout the country every June, and some outside of the month of June, um, again, as Don pointed out, were based on the Stonewall riots in New York. Uh, and that riot, and others before it in Los Angeles, in Philadelphia, and San Francisco, were all triggered by harassment by police. Coming out of World War II, despite the fact that there had been the new ban on gays in the military, most unit commanders looked the other way because they said victory was more important. We have to defeat the Nazis. But a lot of those people, when they got home, they, of course, had served in same-sex units, and they came home and they got organized. They started creating bars and nightclubs where the community could come together and celebrate and meet people. We formed political organizations to start fighting for our rights. But in that McCarthy era, there was constant harassment, raids in bars over and over again throughout the entire country, and that includes Nashville. People were arrested because they were dressed in the wrong gender. People were arrested for holding hands with someone they cared about. People were arrested for dancing with someone of the same gender, even if they weren't touching. They were arrested for that. So it's inevitable that people would get tired of it and say, screw this. And there comes a point, especially after a couple of cocktails, when the police come in and you say, I've had enough, enough is enough, and you throw that martini glass, you grab whatever's available, and you throw it, and you fight back, and that fighting spills out into the streets. And that's what we come together each June to celebrate, to remember, and to commemorate. So, of course, just last weekend, I was at Franklin Pride, and there was also prides in Chattanooga and Memphis. Yesterday, I was at the soccer match in Nashville Soccer Club, and many sports clubs around the country are celebrating pride. We had a good time, even though we didn't win. It was a 0-0 zero -zero draw. We should have won. We were cheated by the ref. <laughs> but um, yesterday, Cookville and Pulaski, Pulaski, Tennessee, had a pride celebration, the birthplace of the Ku Klux Klan. And this was their second one. So we're making progress. We're pushing the envelope throughout the country, not just in big cities like New York and LA, but in Pulaski, Tennessee, Franklin, Tennessee, the home of Marsha Blackburn and Bill Lee. Of course, we got Nashville coming up on June 25th and 26th. And Murfreesboro, when school comes back, September 21st, we invite you to, well, if you can afford to drive to Murfreesboro. <laughs> I'm not sure I can anymore. <laughs> oh, price gouging, I tell you. But, um, but prides are important to us because we come together to celebrate and to remember. We come to organize. Many groups have tables and booths, signing up members, registering people to vote. We have entertainment. We have speakers. It's important because pride encompasses all of this. 
But why do we continue to have to do this? We have made political progress. We've changed laws and policies in government and in private business and industry. Well, there are a lot of negative myths that we have to fight. Perception that I am a sexual predator and that all of us are sexual predators. I'm a college professor. I can't get, think of a position more boring than that. <laughs> Although not all of my colleagues are perfect, I understand that. But this year, this semester, the Tennessee General Assembly made me a criminal because they banned the teaching of divisive concepts. I was teaching this semester, all my classes were African American history. Last semester in this fall, I taught in LGBTQ studies. But even when I teach general American history, I'm covering a wide range of topics. Everything from Native American history to Latino history to women's history, labor history, and yes, the role of religion. And many of those concepts are divisive. And of course, in Tennessee, we hold the distinction of being the state that in 1925 passed the Butler Act banning the teaching of evolution and criminalizing teachers. And the, and the Scopes trial in Ray County made Tennessee a laughing stock. So what are we doing for criminalizing teachers again? And although it says divisive concepts and it was targeted at those of us in history, it could just as easily apply to biology and climate science. So we could see a repeat of the Scopes trial. In some ways, I'm almost hoping we have one because we need to educate people and remind them that we're supposed to have a separation of church and state. This is not a theocracy. <clears throat> I put that bill, or excuse me, that law up on the screen when it passed, and I walked my students through it sentence by sentence and explained how this affected us. And then I said, I'm not changing a damn thing, except I'm no longer recording this class. And I'm asking you not to record my class because I don't want to give them any evidence. If they're gonna come after me, I'm gonna make it hard for them. They destroyed ACORN. And for those of you not familiar with ACORN, it was an organization that registered people to vote, tried to organize black and brown voters in Nashville and in cities all across this country. And they created doctored videos and destroyed a civic service organization. And we're not gonna let them do that to us in education. And they took on a group they did not think would fight back, and we are fighting back. But that bill was just one of many that's passed and has been signed by our governor over the past two years. In the past two years, Tennessee has passed six laws that target transgender people specifically. And last year, four of them, two this year, and last year of those four, they accounted for 50% of the anti-trans laws for the entire country. There were only eight in the entire nation and four came from Tennessee alone. One, of course, targeted um, athletes, transgender athletes. One, transgender bathroom, or, or the use of access to bathrooms one, of course, was a, a business bathroom bill requiring them to post an insulting and humiliating sign. Thankfully, Judge Alita Trauber at the Federal District Court uh, has declared that unconstitutional. And, uh, and then a, one banning gender-affirming care for transgender youth. So they don't want people, not only are they not expanding Medicaid, they don't even want children, transgender children, to gain access to health care. And then in addition to that, this year, uh, uh, taking away funding for public schools if they allow trans athletes, and then a second one targeting transgender athletes in higher education. Of course, specifically the second one was uh, based on um, the success of Leah Thomas, a swimmer at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, she qualified for three events at the recent NCAA swimming championships. She finished dead last in one of them, but she won one of them two seconds slower than the record. But they didn't care about that. They just saw that a trans woman was successful and they were horrified and they wanted to stop that from happening around the country. 
They have a myth that we're taking up athletic scholarships as if transgender people are not deserving of the right to get an education and to be successful. I should point out, specifically with regard to Leah Thomas, she again went to the University of Pennsylvania, or does go, which is an Ivy League school, and they don't give athletic scholarships. So she didn't take an athletic scholarship because he didn't have one in the first place. In Ivy League schools, scholarships are given on academic performance and financial need, and that's it. So she's a good swimmer. Great. I ran track in high school. We actually ran some meets right over here at East High School, and I knew that if I wanted to go to the Olympics, I'd have to buy a ticket. <laughs> but I love to run, and the children, and we're talking about children mostly now, the children deserve the right to be part of a team if they wouldn't be, whether it's track or swimming or soccer or volleyball. They just want to fit in with their friends. And that's assuming they want to play sports. For starters, half of trans youth are trans men, not trans women. And many of them don't give a damn about sports. They'd be more interested in the drama club, which for many schools, that's where a lot of LGBT students found a community and started to come out. But if they do want to play sports, they probably want to play sports just to fit in, to be part of a team. And when their friends go to the bathroom, you know, just, just sort of, you just follow the crowd, you go in and you take care of your business. You're not there to create problems. But these politicians have no agenda. I was on Channel 5 last week and I pointed out, we need to focus on improving our public schools. We need to focus on access to health care. We need to deal with our traffic problems. And she said, oh, amen to that. <laughs> What are they talking about? Oh, are they talking about making schools safer? Are they talking about making nightclubs safer? 49 people died in Orlando six years ago tonight. No, they're saying, ooh, we, got, we can't let transgender people go to the bathroom. Ooh, we can't let transgender people swim. That's what they're focused on. And that's why Pride continues to be important to us why we continue to have to organize and fight back, and why allies are so important for those of you who do not identify with the LGBTQ community. We need your support, not just with politicians, but within the people in your day-to-day -day lives, in your workplaces, in whatever other social groups you may go to. When someone says something ignorant and hateful, call them out for it. And especially at those family events. Because that kid sitting at the end of the table is trying to figure out who they are and where they fit. And when they hear Uncle Joe or Aunt Jean say something hateful, they need to hear you fight back for them. Because as adults, they need us. And secretly, they know it. They may not know how to express it, but they know I need somebody that I can turn to. And let it be known that you are that person. <coughs> so as we move forward, obviously this is an election year, and you heard I'm partisan, but I know the group is not, so I'm not going to advertise on a partisan basis. But I hope you get involved. There are candidates out there who need your help. If you can afford to write a check, please do so. But maybe give an hour or two of your time. Make some phone calls. Get out, they need people to knock on doors in these neighborhoods, especially outside of Davidson County. Davidson's not really the problem. But if you do live outside of Davidson or you have family and friends outside of Davidson, you know, please, please help them. Um, you know, you know, the folks in Pulaski are standing up and organizing. People in Williamson County are standing up and organizing. So please help them. Make those phone calls to our legislators. The Equality Act, our federal bill, has passed in the House of Representatives. 
but it's one of those many, many pieces of legislation stalled in the Senate because of the filibuster. So we all have the same two U.S. Senators, and you know who they are. Some of you probably have written or called in the past, but let them know where you stand on the Equality Act. I believe in equal rights for everybody. The Constitution says equal protection of the laws under the 14th Amendment, but it also says that you can, you know, follow up with legislation to enforce this. And that's what the Equality Act is designed to do. Because as we're seeing, the Supreme Court can take away rights. We know that. They're in the process of doing that. And if they do that with abortion rights, then the next step could be any number of rights. Because Roe versus Wade was based on the Fourth Amendment against you know, protecting your papers, houses, persons, persons, and effects. So if they take away right to privacy, what's next? Obviously, contraception. That was based on right to privacy. The Lawrence and Garner versus Texas case was right to privacy. And I remember the day the Supreme Court ruled on that, and I think it was 2003, about an hour after the ruling, CNN had Jerry Falwell on. And he was red in the face, and he was furious, and he was just so angry, and he was saying, the Supreme Court should not grant, and he got stuck on that phrase, right to privacy, and he started stuttering, and he's like, he did not want to acknowledge that we should have a right to privacy. The whole concept that a person's home is their castle is right to privacy. And that's what the Supreme Court used to support but so many of our rights are taken, being taken away. And if we're not careful, equal protection of the laws could also be taken away. So we have to continue fighting, we have to continue organizing. And anything that each and every one of you can do as, an as individuals and what Sunday Assembly Nashville can do as an organization is important. We need those voices, we need those allies. So I appreciate your time. Um, I, uh, I don't know, Nobody sent me the schedule. I don't know if I have time for Q&A or if you got something else, uh, if we're on a, got a tight schedule. Two minutes, okay. I'm happy to take two minutes of questions, yes. Oh, he's got a microphone for you. At these schools, what is the law that, that they go by saying that they can't, that they won't take transgender, uh, allow these uh, transgender, the, the bathrooms and all that? So what are, what, how, could, how are they allowed to say no? Well, first off, the Tennessee General Assembly passed that. Um, last year, the school bathroom bill was signed by the governor on May 14, 2021. So that is a Tennessee law. So there, these bills, these laws, are being challenged in court. So like I mentioned, the, the business bathroom sign bill has been declared unconstitutional. Um, and so other challenges have been filed by different organizations, and I don't recall where that one stands legally. But so these challenges are being made, um, not just in Tennessee, but in many other states around the country. And um, our argument was that Title IX which bans sex discrimination, does cover LGBT people, and this bill, these laws, would because Title IX isn't just about sports, it's about education, even in the K through 12 level. So we believe these laws violate Title IX. So why can't you just go to court? Court, you have to go to court. Uh, so, and so, and again, with the business sign bill, it was a, the federal district court of Middle Tennessee. So the judge is Alita Trauber, she's the one it was in her court, and she's the one who issued the ruling throwing out that law. So, so that's how it's done. So we have to have people file these lawsuits, and the courts have to decide on them. And so that leaves our fate in the hands of courts. And as I just was saying, that's kind of iffy at times. Anyone? Yes. I have a question. Oh, wait, never mind. <laughs> Um, I wanted to ask, as a community, what can we do to be more of an advocate, a, a co-conspirator with our LGBTQIA <laughs> community? 
Uh, we openly say that we are an inclusive community and we welcome all who welcome all. And that's meaningful, but I feel like we need to take it to the next level and really make our voices heard. That this is a place where love is welcome in all of its colors. Part, uh, visibility, and that, that's part of what pride is all about. It's about visibility and letting people see us and hear us. And, and the same is true with uh, Sunday Assembly Nashville. Visibility uh, and the, the secular community has to be more visible and to fight for that First Amendment clause, no law respecting the establishment of religion and standing up to these legislators and then defeating the ones who keep voting yes for this stuff. Um, you know, we've got to organize. It's, it's hard. It's, I've been doing it for a long time. I don't know how much longer I have, but, uh, but, but you know, I, I acknowledge it's difficult, but it's necessary. Is that it? Well, thank you very much for your time. It's glad to be back. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Richmond. That was I, personally inspiring to me. Um, now it's time for a moment of mindfulness, a brief instant of tranquility to uh, allow us to be in the moment, perhaps to reflect on the messages that we've just heard, or simply to be aware of our own space and of the, and of the world around us. Is it time for another piece from the band? That's another great thing about being in person once again after two years of Zoom is actually getting to hear the, the, the band live.
Yes, the unnamed assembly band, y'all. Like I said, it's just wonderful to be able to hear them live again. Okay. Yeah, give them a hand. We'll get to the part where we do announcements and acknowledgments, and let's see if the folks who have hats are um, handy, uh, because we are a nonprofit. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm rusty. It's been a little. It's been a while since I've done this. Now it's time. Y'all can cool your heels for just a moment. Now it's time for the segment that we call Trying My Best, where someone in our community shares an experience of striving, overcoming, or making their way through a situation. Please welcome the mother of the, mid, of the middle ground potluck, Georgia Phelps. Hi, everyone. Just so you know, this is the very first time I've ever done a Try My Best. I'm going to cry, so you can all be welcome to join me. <laughs> and as Don has so well stated, assertiveness enables us, one, me, to confidently, respectfully, and appropriately stand up for my own, one's own self-interests. Is there a picture up there? Yeah. <laughs> this tree is a living reminder of my assertiveness. It was early July 2019, and I was still reeling from the devastating news of my dear friend and business partner Gabby's terminal diagnosis. When I realized I had to hurry, which you know is not my forte, and tie up all remaining loose ends with my dying friend in the next six weeks or less. This would have been no problem if I had had clear access to her, as in prior days, when we talked or saw each other on a daily basis. But this extraordinary circumstance immediately drew everyone to her bedside, from her husband, who was permanently employed out of state, to her two beloved daughters and sons-in-law, to her parents, who were flying in from Germany, to several groups of other close friends, relatives, and acquaintances. And I needed to navigate an immediate swell of people waiting for an audience with her as enormous as the emotional tsunami we were all facing. The competition was real, resulting in limited opportunities to give my friend a thorough affirmation of our solid 13-year friendship. I needed to make sure I left nothing unsaid or unfinished between us, as did everyone else. An inner battle began raging. I had always been considerate to step aside when her family was in town, but now adding this large surge of devotees had me facing my biggest challenge. I had to muster the courage to assert myself or forever live with regret. I still remember that word like a glaring neon sign facing me down in an attempt to unnerve and dissuade me. An internal balancing act began playing out to not overly impose on her now very protective husband, her rightfully possessive girls, and her grief-laden parents, not to mention 
the myriad of others vying for a slot on a constantly gridlocked schedule. I chose to act upon my conviction and ask for as many visits that the family would allow while simultaneously respecting the obvious needs of all. It wasn't easy to override my passive nature and the logistics were sometimes complicated. But I'm pleased to tell you that I was successful in acquiring all the coveted moments I needed to demonstrate and honor our special connection and to complete our journey together. When she left us, there was still one more thing I could not deny myself, the surviving friend who would be returning without her to our favorite walking trail where we'd spend untold hours bonding, where Stephen and I had first received the horrific report of her illness and where her memory would always inhabit. And that was making sure that there was some kind of memorial of her at Long Hunter State Park. Again, it took more courage to negotiate and compromise with her husband, but I can happily report that there is now a tree I call Gabby at the center of the trail entrance with outstretched limbs welcoming all who pass through, a fitting tribute, comfort, and reminder for me that in death, my friend certainly left me with a most valuable life lesson in assertiveness. Thank you. Okay, now the folks with the hats. Just mentioned we are a nonprofit. Uh, we rely on donations. If you see people with these green name tags, that's because uh, these are sustaining members that uh, are able to uh, donate regularly. Uh, you can go to the website sundayassemblynashville.com to find out how to do that. Let's see. Also, some information up there. Yes. Yes, go ahead. Come on up here. I apologize. We normally have uh, we don't normally have programs uh, for the month, and we did not get that uh, quite done. Uh, come on up. Just put your hand. Hey, everybody! Happy Pride Month. Um, just a quick announcement. Um, I don't have a slideshow for it, but just, just a reminder that next month on July 30th is NanoCon again, and we're excited to be back in person. Thank you. And um, if you, like me, uh, we're looking forward to hearing Dave Warnock last month, and if you, like me, were delighted that we got to hear Dr. Marissa Richmond this month, guess what? Both of those speakers we're fortunate to have coming to NanoCon, so come check that out. Um, absolutely, thank you. Um, just real quick, the, the theme of NanoCon this year is finding your community. And personally, I've been reminded of like an events like this, which you know brings like three, four hundred people from all over like this region, a, a six state area. How much it means to a lot of people. We've had people just buy tickets within the last little bit from like New York, Arkansas, and it's just like shocking, right? But it really does mean a lot to people. And and a token of that is how much support of um, like just participation and showing up and having fun has come from Sunday Assembly right here. Uh, how many right now are planning on going to NanoCon? A show of hands. Awesome. Um, if you would like to come and have not gotten your ticket, uh, we do just um, due to uh, the space constraints, it's 350 tickets max. So if you want to come and haven't gotten yours yet, um, there's two ways you can do it. Either go to the website, nanocon.rocks, too easy, right? And, um, and get yours. And um, I will note that to encourage people to get theirs early, like by the 15th of the month, there is like a slight increase in cost. So if you get yours before the 15th, then you uh, can beat that. And or you, what you can also do is you can uh, come talk to myself 
um, uh, or Sarah Cho, who is going to be, uh, there's, she, there she is, um, who's going to be the volunteers coordinator and say, hey, I would like to help out, help to make it happen. And for a, just a two hour commitment to help out, um, you can get in for free. So anyways, um, thanks so much and uh, see you guys next month. me I'm always looking for a party <laughs> place we can jam and so uh, we came up with an idea there there is a B&B &B five miles about eight minute drive from the state park where we can all gather and I need to have reservations I made a reservation but I need to have confirmed um, occupants for Friday and Saturday night it's seventy dollars per person, and um, if you're interested in doing that, to have a place to gather during the day, um, all anytime, Friday night, Friday afternoon, actually, from three on and through Sunday, eleven a.m. Please check with me, and I'll see if I can arrange a place for you there. Also, uh, potluck, middle ground smoop has been canceled due to. COVID masking, so we're going to do something else in its place. Brenda and I will make an announcement on uh, meetup for a picnic. Okay. Is it? Miss yeah, we'll we'll have a park picnic probably in during the daytime hours instead of middle ground. So you know, thanks. Well. That's one I can cross off my list of announcing. <laughs> okay, um, as you can see up here, there are many ways to get involved in Sunday Assembly in many different aspects. Uh, those are the uh, leaders for each one. If you feel like you've got, that's one of your niches, or one of those niches is your niche, uh, go see that person, go get in touch with them. Uh, if you, uh, well, like that. Also, uh, if somebody wants to lead the Help Often group, uh, you notice that Stephen's up there as interim. Uh, if, you're in, if somebody out there is in interested in that, uh, go see Stephen uh, or get in touch with him. Um, any of you that are on the Secret Sunday Ascending group, uh, you, can, uh, you can post something there, uh, your interest. Uh, let's see, is our, there's our social media right there, many ways to get involved, uh, get in, stay in communication. Um, as was just mentioned, uh, we're going to have a picnic next Sunday, location to be determined, watch uh, for announcements either through the secret group or through Meetup. Let's see, the next assembly is July 10th right here, hopefully. The COVID rating will go back below high like it had been and we can uh, not require masking and have, the pot and have our potluck afterward. Anybody else have any uh, announcements that uh, need to be made? Ah, yes, yes. Uh, need volunteers uh, for Pride um, for pr our booth, right? Yes, okay, that, I thought I saw that. Um, so, um, let's see, that's, uh, that, that has been announced on the secret, uh, group as well. Uh, is there something on meetup? I can't remember. Yeah, there's a meeting event on, on meetup. Okay. Official sign up is Tuesday 10th is, um, Sunday, July 10th. Got it, got it. Uh, so there'll be, um, so it's officially, if you couldn't hear, uh, the, um, it's an official event on meetup for each shift. Um, you can choose whichever one you're able to uh, volunteer for. Anything else? Okay, so now some thoughts in closing. On my computer at work, I have a quote by L.R. Nost as a reminder to my type B self, don't make yourself small, not for anyone. And this pertains to how you relate to your family members, siblings, parents, your partner, this pertains to how you interact with coworkers and supervisors, with friends and acquaintances, with strangers. Many of you here in our community have had to stand up and say no to family and friends regarding your values and your non-belief. 
I see you. Don't make yourself small. Take up the space that you should have. I'm not saying it's easy. I know it's not for me. Now, what I can say, and I'm saying this for myself as much as anyone, is that the more you can say, this is what I want, and that is not something I will accept, the more you know what's important to you, and the more confidently you can walk through life. I'm touching on personal assertiveness here because of its role in asserting the rights of all. Advocacy and activism depend on personal agency and autonomy to be effective. If you see it in yourself, it's easier to want the same for others. Anything that denies a person's autonomy and agency deserves to be met with resistance. Whatever denies these things to a group based on some benign common trait deserves a forceful and sustained pushback. There seems to be an abundance now of swaggering, overindulged people with a false sense of grievance, seeking to reimpose the days when their privilege went unchecked and their discriminations overlooked. These people, be it ordinary folks or authorities, are reaching beyond their space and intruding into ours. Not everybody who's their target can make themselves heard, so the rest of us should add to their voice, or sometimes be their voice. Glennon Doyle, in an appearance on the radio program On Being, said that she added activist to her resume after reading a quote that said, you can only pull people out of the river for so long until you have to look up river to find out who's pushing them in. And Doyle said, we have to go up river. I just want to spend the rest of my life pulling people out of the river and also just creating living hell for the people who are pushing them in. And as I see it, we're in a period where the old quiet parts of selfish or malicious motivation are being spoken out loud. And for someone with my value system, even if I'm type B, I'm thinking it's time to start going up river. Thank you very much. And it's time now for the un unnamed assembly band to close out our assembly. All right, that was awesome. Let's give Don another hand as our host. Great job. Thank you to everybody who has uh, participated today. Um, and, and I will say, like, I personally and anecdotally, I, I see the type of change that uh, Dr. Richmond was talking about. When you have uh, a, re a traditionally religious parent take time to make a gift basket for one of their kids' friends and colleagues who is going through top surgery, like, and having parties for them. And you, these, are, these are movements that are happening that when we talk about these things, good things happen, right? And it changes people's perceptions. And so that assertiveness is, is incredible and it matters and it's working. So let's, let's keep fighting that fight, right? Um, are we ready? Are we tuned? Are we good? Okay. So we've got a few songs just to close this out. Um, uh, the lyric, the main... Uh, this song is Stand, and I let you sit the whole time. So I'm going to politely request that if you're able and willing to come up and stand with us, and let's do a song or two, okay? Or three, maybe. Stand in the place where you
few times over the nine years or so that we have it, one of our favorites, and so uh, excited for it. Hold on one second. One second.
All right, that was fun. We've got one song to close it out. You all know it very well, even those folks who we haven't seen in so long. And I just want to say, it's so good to see you all, all these folks that we haven't been either overseas or other places. And hey, wear masks, come see us. We love you all. Uh, so special thanks to Jason and Joel and Loey and Steve and Rod and, uh, uh, oh my goodness, and all the band, and, you know, everybody who's, who's volunteers to help make this possible today. We appreciate it. Show up for Pride, right? Like, show up, volunteer, be there. Uh, they did it in L.A. It was great. All right, we're going to start, we're going to finish with uh, Stephen's song, yeah. the uh, uh, I Believe in Good.